It's a pleasure to welcome to the Australian Music Vault, Missy Higgins. Thanks for joining us. No worries. Thanks for having me. I want to take you back to where it all began for you, picking up the piano or learning how to play the piano at a very young age. Mm. Do you remember that time in your life? Um, I was pretty young, so I don't really remember, you know, the first time I played piano, but I was about six when my parents put me into piano lessons. Um, and I learnt the Suzuki method, which is the method of the ear. So I never really learnt to learn music, <laughs> which is a bit annoying now. Was piano something you wanted to do? Um, do you know, I can't even remember. Mm. I should ask my parents. But my dad always played piano um, up the other end of the house. There was always the sound of his piano kind of wafting through all the rooms. So um, I think it just seemed like a natural progression that I would learn piano and he helped me learn too. He used to sit with me every night for half an hour to practice. And as you say, the Suzuki method is just by ear. You don't yeah. learn how to read music. Has... I think that was really handy actually because <laughs> it, well, it, it helped train my ear to be able to pick up things and, and play them without having to kind of read the music. What kind of role did the piano play or music play as far as your musical abilities and, cre and creativity? Um, well, I, I played piano up until I became a teenager and then I realised that piano wasn't a very cool instrument to play so I wanted to play electric guitar just like Courtney Love. Um, so I told my, my parents that I was quitting and also I hated classical music at the time so I just wanted to, you know, play pop songs or, or jazz or something a bit interesting because it just seemed really, like, strict and um, regimented. So... Um, yeah, so I, I quit for a while and I, I taught myself guitar and, and got, got about a year's worth of lessons of guitar and, um, yeah, started playing all the kind of Oasis and Hole and Nirvana and Blur, um, Bush kind of songs. And, uh, and that was really fun because I could accompany myself in a way that I, I didn't know how to yet with piano. But then when I drifted back to playing piano and writing my own songs, I was really glad to have that that knowledge, that technical knowledge of how to play because when I realised that, oh, I don't have to play classical music, I can actually write my own songs or do whatever genre I want, then it just opened up all this, all this stuff for me and I, I had the technical ability to do it. Fantastic. Mm. Were there many Australian artists that were influential to you around that time? You mentioned a lot of the grunge acts and the Britpop mm. acts, but was there, do you have any memories of Australian artists or particular Australian songs that were around? Um, I really loved Frente and I really loved Crowded House. Um, they were probably the first Australian bands, I don't know if you can call Crowded House Australian-ish <laughs> Ish. bands. Two um, thirds. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I learnt to play Frente's The Book Song on um, guitar and that was one of the first songs I performed actually in like middle school in year eight. Um, and then when I got a little bit older, I discovered The Waifs um, and Casey Chambers um, and then eventually Paul Kelly. So, uh, but The Waifs and Casey Chambers were huge influences on me, as well as Something for Kate, actually. Something for Kate were a huge influence. So yeah, those around those kind of teenage years, there was quite a few Australian bands doing kind of yeah, folky or kind of um, acoustic rock. And, all, and storytellers too. Mm, what are those yeah. artists you mentioned? Yeah, I think I've always been really drawn to music that has very um, visual lyrics mm. and um, I'm always drawn to the lyrics of a song first. It, c it can be musically brilliant but if it's not grabbing me with the story or the originality of the, the poetry, I just it just loses me straight away. So, yeah, I was... I was really drawn to that um, in the waves, the, the storytelling aspect of all their songs. I just thought it was so beautiful. Your first stage experience was Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoach? Oh, uh, yeah. How old were you? Um, well, I actually did two um, productions of Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoach. One was in um, middle school, so I think I would have been in year actually... One was in and one was in primary school in year five, and then the next one was in year eight in middle school. So um, I uh, I progressed. I think in the first 
production I was just a narrator <laughs> with no singing <laughs> and um, and then at the year eight one I got to have a couple of solos I was Isaac and my my costume was a, a hessian sack so but that was a really special um, very formative kind of experience for me because I, I got to have my first solo holding a microphone on a stage under a spotlight and it just, yeah, it blew my world right open. Like I just loved it so much. So the door was open effectively. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I just, I got such a high from performing and from, you know, seeing my, my parents and my brother afterwards and they were like, you were amazing. We didn't know you could sing. And uh, I think just part of me just came alive when I performed. I, I didn't, I, I mean, I'd always been quite a kind of, uh, I don't know, performery child. Like I, I was quite a confident, more precocious kid, but I'd never actually sung on stage before. And uh, so that was the first time I realised it was what I wanted to do when I grew up. So you write a song called All For Believing. Mm. And your sister submits it to Triple J Unearthed. Mm. You're about, what, 16, 17 at this point? Um, I was, when I wrote All For Believing, I was 15, 16, so I was in year 10. Um, I know that because it was about my year 10 boyfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then two years later, she submitted the recording of it to Triple J Unearthed. Yeah. Uh, who then added it to their playlist. Yeah. Yeah, so it... It, it won that and then I got to perform at the Unearthed concert um, at the Awaki Auditorium in Melbourne and, yeah, they put it on high rotation on Triple J, which was just kind of mind-blowing. I was still in Year 12 at the time and everyone was kind of busy preparing for exams and I was like, ah, I'm going to be a singer. <laughs> I'm not studying. You go and do it. I'm having fun. So it was cool. It was really fun. So... How did life change once that song was being played? You're in Year 12, Geelong Grammar? Yeah. And studying for exams and yet you've got this song going gangbusters on the radio, you're invited to play shows. Mm. How did life change? Um, I think I got a bit more respect from the kids at school. <laughs> I think they thought it was pretty awesome. Um, yeah, I remember the phone call from, from the woman at Triple J. I didn't even really kind of remember that my sister had entered it and she was like, are you sitting down? I think you're going to need to sit down for this news. And, um, and then when she told me, I had no idea what she was talking about and then I was like, oh, my sister, ah, oh, my sister entered me. And then it didn't even occur that it would be a kind of a life-changing thing that would happen to me. Um, but, yeah, I think it, re it changed Year 12 for me because I was so stressed about my exams and studying and um, it kind of took me off the hook a bit because before that my dad was like, you know, you go to uni and you get an, uh, just get an arts degree. If you don't know what to do, just go and get an arts degree, you know, just so you have something to fall back on if music doesn't work out for you. And so when I got my record deal, he was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe that's a proper job, you know, see how you go. <laughs> well, let's, let's talk about that record deal because there had been a lot of offers and record deals on the table and it took you a while to navigate mm. the one that was right for you. T yeah. just tell, me about, tell me about navigating your way through, through people, I guess, wanting to mould you and, and, and make you into a star, as it were, and finding the right, you know, well, in eventually signing up to 11 with John Watson. Yeah, I... Um... I guess I, I needed a manager at first, so I met with a few different potential managers and um, it was a gut instinct because I felt as though s some of them wanted me to be something that I wasn't, you know, they were kind of asking if I could sing, you know, an octave higher than what I was already doing and, you know, obviously we'd have to, you know, change your outfit and blah, blah, blah and um, it just gave me a really icky feeling. And then, um, and then yeah, John Watson came along and he just... Um, he, he listened to what I want because I, at that age, I still had a pretty strong vision of who, who I was and who I wasn't. And I was really determined not to be this young pop starlet that was, you know, just blew in and out of town. You know, I, I knew that I had substance and I really wanted people to know that. So, um, I, I wanted to, I wanted to go traveling and really kind of have some life experience in order to, to write a, a really good album. So I told him I didn't want to write an album straight away. I wanted to go backpacking with my best friend through Europe 
for my gap year and then I'd come back and do an album. And he was all for that. In fact, he thought that was a really great idea because he knew that I was young and, and he had a much longer, a much bigger vision, you know, than the other people that I'd met with, I thought. Um, and I knew from his reaction to that that he, yeah, he, he had a long-term plan in mind, which was which is a really great thing to, to feel. Um, so I signed with him and then his, his label is Eleven, a music company. Um, and they're, yeah, they're a, a, an indie music label based in Sydney and it's, it's, it's small. There's, there's only kind of half a dozen people that work there and everyone's really kind of like a family. And I have that immediate relationship with them all. You know, it's not this kind of big kind of company that I don't feel like I have... Um, any control in my own, you know, journey. I feel like I'm very much, um, we're all kind of collaborators in it, which is really nice. I don't ever feel like things are going out of my control. Looking back, it's, it's amazing that you had such a vision and a clear focus of who you were at, at such a young age because a, a lot of artists and a lot of teenagers certainly don't and it did happen for you quite quickly. Mm. What happened? Where did that come from, that inner strength and that focus to know, no, this is who I am? Because, you know, those record companies, the ones that you didn't sign with, wanted, as, as you said, wanted to mould you into something you weren't. How did you, mm. how did you know that, where did that come from, that inner strength to say, this isn't who I am? Um, I don't really know, to be honest. I'm not sure why I was so confident back then. <laughs> um, I think I was always a bit of a tomboy. Well, a lot of a tomboy, actually. I, you know, when I was really young, I cut all my hair off and all my friends were boys and, you know, I used to climb trees and play, you know, soldiers. And um, so, I mean, I and I'd grown up with, with a lot of, um, you know, I'd grown up seeing women portrayed in the music industry as being very much, you know, about their bodies and about their appearance and you know, portrayed as not maybe not the smartest people and as though there were kind of, you know, businessmen behind them kind of shaping their career. You know, there was the Spice Girls and all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And I wanted to be the antidote to that. I didn't, I, I, um, I really wanted to be respected for my music and maybe that was growing up in a musical household and my older brother was a musician who I really admired and we used to talk about music all the time and songwriting and we were very passionate about the craft and the art of it, you know. So the last thing I wanted was to be dressed up in, you know, a short skirt and high heels and tried to, you know, be made something that I wasn't. Mm, mm. Yeah. And and then hence hence you go travelling. Did you find those life experiences you were looking for in that gap year? Yeah, I mean, I think mostly I just wanted to have a bit of fun before I got, you know, bogged down in the, the whole touring full on, you know, promotional schedule that I knew that releasing an album would be. Um, and John had said to me, you know, once the roller coaster goes starts going, you know, you can't get off it until it's finished. Um, so I think it was just a really good thing to kind of get out of the way so I didn't feel like I'd missed out on a, a rite of passage. Mm. You know, I didn't have any experiences in Europe that I, you know, immediately <laughs> had to write a song about or anything. But um, I think I just, you know... I, I was just kind of enjoying life a bit, you know. It must have been comforting to know that when you got back to Australia, there was, you know, an album deal waiting. There was, yeah, music. yeah, comforting and also nerve wracking. <laughs> like I remember being in Europe and just going, "Oh my god, I, f- I should be writing songs. I should be, I should be gathering experiences." <laughs> I was putting a lot of pressure on myself actually. So when I got back, I didn't write a song for a while, but um, yeah, I soon, I soon got into the groove of it. Your first single, Scar, comes out and it, it was as you with your, the shortest hair possible in mm-hmm. front of a piano, mm-hmm. dressed as you wanted to dress and it literally takes Australia by storm. It debuts at number one, which is nuts when you think about it mm. because many artists wait their whole life for a number one single, yeah. let alone an album, but yeah. here you were with your debut. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty crazy. Um, I... I don't think I, I ever expected that. I mean, I guess nobody expects that really. <laughs> um, but I, I'd worked on it for so long and I felt as though 
by that point I'd been doing so much touring and had actually got up a really good live fan base. I mean, I'd supported George and John Butler and The Waifs and Pete Murray and Lior. Um, so before I'd even released my first album, I'd done so much touring and I felt like um, that really helped, you know, once the album was kind of released that I'd, I'd kind of met everybody at the shows afterwards and signed EPs and got talking to them all. And I think um, doing the rounds of Australia a few times, doing live shows really helped with that. What did you learn from those artists like John Butler, The Waifs and George? That was, that was an interesting time in Australian music because the 90s had, were very much finished mm. as far as the, the, the explosion of Australian bands, as it were. Yeah. And then, yeah, we had this, it was almost veering to folk, you know, with those yeah. artists, an explosion of those folk artists. Yeah, kind of rootsy mm. folk Australian. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I learned a lot about um, performing from them. Um, I think I, I learnt a lot about stage banter from the waves because <laughs> they're so they're so great to watch live. You know, they they talk back and forth to each other and they joke with the audience and it's all very like, you know, listen to this funny thing that I did today. So it made me realise that I could just be myself. I can just be as daggy as I wanted on stage, um, and they were really really lovely to me too. Like really um, really nurturing and apart from when I had some friends backstage and we drank all of the Waifs Rider. I, that did not go down well. <laughs> I soon realised that that's not something that you're supposed to do. So, um, yeah, but apart from that, I mean, I, I just, I, I really loved it and I got a really great feel for what it was like to be um, a touring artist and be in the Australian music industry and I felt very supported by those guys. So Scar ends up winning Song of the Year and Breakthrough song at the Arias the following year, uh, 2005 I think it was. Mm -hmm. What do you think it was that resonated with so many people with that particular song? Hmm, I don't really know. Um, I've never even thought about that. <laughs> I'm just trying to think of the lyrics in the chorus. Wait to uh, leave your scar on me. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's about though. It's about learning. It's about learning from your mistakes and using um, these bad experiences to make yourself stronger. I guess. I mean, ultimately, it's a song about um, about perf perseverance and, and inner strength and going. Um, I'm gonna you, I'm gonna remember this. Can you can you leave me with a scar so that when I go forward, I can remember not to make the same mistakes and I can I can make better choices. It's great. The Sound of White is released then, or well, around the same time, and again just goes gangbusters for you. Mm. What do you remember of that period when, when it was just all happening, you were being booked for shows, festivals, winning awards? Was it a whirlwind? Was it the roller coaster that John Watson said it would be? Yes, it was such a roller coaster. I remember I was supporting Pete Murray at the time and he was playing at the Horden Pavilion. Um, and just after I came off stage for my, my support set, um, my manager came in with a bottle of champagne and he said, you just reached number one. <laughs> and, um, and it was a really weird thing. Like I was kind of looking out at Pete Murray's audience and going, wow, I've got the number one album in the country. Um, and it was almost too, yeah, it was almost too good to experience at the time. Like I can look back on it now and feel so grateful for it. But at the time, I think it was all happening so quickly and um, I was almost just in disbelief, I think. And so busy too, you know, because mm. it was, I was touring a lot, a lot and kind of thinking about the next album too. So, um, yeah, sometimes those, those things are kind of more fun in retrospect. <laughs> and in retrospect, there wasn't, an Australian female doing what you were doing as the singer-songwriter on the piano, on the guitar. Th there was no one really filling that void. I mean, there might have been people after you or, or certainly people of lesser known, you know, lesser known fame, say. Mm -hmm. But there was no one doing what you were doing. You were quite unique. Mm, well, there was Delta Goodrum who was... But she was more on the pop side. More on the pop side, yeah. I guess I was more on the, the folk yeah. rootsy side, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, when I when I first started singing and playing piano, it was it was a really conscious thing for me um, to do something that no one was doing in Australia at the time. I I was a big fan of Sarah McLachlan, and and I just thought, wow, this is she's such a cool, strong woman, you know, writing her own songs, playing the piano, supporting herself instrumentally, and um, I wanted to be like the Australian Sarah McLaughlin. Um, and I wanted to, yeah, like I said, I wanted to be the antidote to the, to the you know, the trust up mm. <laughs> um, pop starlet. I wanted to be, I wanted to show people that a woman, a, a singer-songwriter woman could have su- a substance just mm. as much as a, a male singer-songwriter and that we didn't need to use our body or our looks to get there. Uh, then you re- then released a, on a clear night in two thousand and seven. There was a three year gap there. What was going on with you between those two records? Between the sound of white and, and on a clear on night. And on a clear night, yeah. Um, I was a bigger gap between on a clear night I and know, the and next uh, one. The old razzle dazzle. That yeah. was the big one, wasn't it? Well, uh, big gap. I mean, I just I'm not a very prolific songwriter, so I I can't just churn out music like some people can do. I wish I could. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Um, but I guess because, I mean, my songs are so confessional and, um, so honest, I, and, and, and the best songs that I write are really raw. So, um, I guess I don't want to release an album unless I feel like it's a really strong body of work. I mean, I do write a lot of songs. There's a lot of songs that just get thrown out because, yeah, ultimately I want to kind of distill it down to a really powerful, you know, book of stories. Um, so I think it's worth it to take as long as it takes to get there. Much better than just kind of releasing song after song that aren't, that you can't stand behind, you know. Mm. Is, is it, is it, is there an element of vulnerability that goes along with releasing something that's so raw and so personal and putting it out there? Or by the time yeah. that you've turned it, is it, 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 is it a cathartic experience for you where, where once it's out, it's, it's done? I'm not too worried about releasing really personal songs because, yeah, it is cathartic. And, and I mean, ultimately I, I just really want to r- release good songs. So if it's really honest and really kind of, um, I don't know, revealing. I don't mind just as long as it's a really good song. It's like, oh, it's I will sacrifice anything to the gods to write a good song, you know. Um, even if it means writing about someone that I know or an ex or upsetting someone, it's like, it's just such an amazing thing to do. It's like what song writers or writers of any sort live for, you know, to write something good. So you do whatever it takes. And if it means bearing your soul, you do it. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, did you move to WA in 2006? I lived in Broome for a while in WA. What yeah. was the reason for that? I went to Broome um, with someone I was dating at the time because, yeah, she used to live up there and she was like raving to me about it for years and years about how this place was like the, the most special, beautiful, quiet place on earth and that I would love it. And eventually I was like, okay, just take me. <laughs> so... Um, we went up there and it was exactly what I needed. It was, I was a bit um, confused and felt a bit stifled by the, the quick fame that I'd gotten from my first album. So uh, Broome was this really kind of tucked away, hidden place where nobody judged you and, you know, nobody cares what they look like and everyone's so earthy and um, uh, I just loved it. So I, so yeah. So I moved there. Also, a, I mean, it's it's raw Australia. It's natural mm. Australia, isn't it? The yeah. land, there, yeah. the landscapes. Yeah, it's um, it's the first place I went to that I really felt a connection to the the raw landscape of Australia, like the Australia that you feel like you see in the tourist magazines. <laughs> you know, like that red pindan dirt, and the you know the 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 boab trees and the really huge rustic beaches and, um, yeah, just going camping under the stars and there's just nothing like getting that far away from the city and lying under a blanket of stars every night to just make you feel so grounded. On your third record, which came out in 2012, 
you'd obviously done a lot of growing up between 2004, the first record, the sound mm -hmm. white to, to the old razzle dazzle. Mm. Were you in a much better place then? Yeah, I was. I was in a good place when I recorded the old razzle dazzle. I think between those two albums, I'd gone through a really hard period of depression and writer's block and everything in between. Um, but I'd made my way back to music eventually. You know, I kind of deviated off the path and thought I didn't want to do it anymore and um, I was burnt out and um, I thought that there must be more to life and that, you know, I wanted to really make a difference. And then when I eventually found my way back to music, I realised that that was the way that I was going to make a difference and, and that was the tool that I'd been given, you know, um, and that I was super lucky to have been given that and to be to be good at it and to, to actually really enjoy it. If I was honest with myself, I really enjoy performing. Um, so, yeah, by the time the old Razzle Dazzle came around, um, I was in a good place and I think there's a lot of there's a lot of songs on that album about music and about what it means to me and what a challenge it was having writer's block but ultimately how much, how big a part music plays in my life. Uh, you enrolled in Indigenous Studies in 2010 before the old Razzle Dazzle yeah. came out at the University of Melbourne. Mm. What spurred you to do that? Well, I'd quit music at that stage. I said to my manager that, I'm, I'm quitting indefinitely because I don't love it anymore and I can't write songs and, you know, I felt like I was just bashing my head against a wall at that point. Um, so I just said, look, I just have no choice. There's nothing in me. Um, I need to do something else and um, if I come back to music, that's great. If I don't, that's okay too. Um, you know, because my dad had always, and my mum, they'd both said to me, you know, you've done enough. Even if you don't ever write another album again, you've done so well. <laughs> you know, you've achieved what m most people would, would dream of achieving in their music career. So, And were you thinking, no, no, I've still yeah, got so much more. I was like, I'm still in my 20s. <laughs> what else am I going to do? But at the same time, I just, I really couldn't write songs anymore. So, um you know, that made, did make me feel a bit better about, yeah, deciding to go another direction. And then eventually I, I made my way back to music but only after really kind of telling myself that I was going to do something else and then it, it's that classic, you know, you have to go away from it to realise what you love. Yeah. Did you get the doctorate or the or the diploma? Or oh, God, no. no. No? I only went for a semester. <laughs> it was too hard. Mm. Yeah, all that footnoting. Mm. No thanks. Oh, I want to talk about your your uh, Oz record mm -hmm. from 2014, I think it was, where you you uh, covered such things like the Warumpi Band, Black Fella, White Fella. You mm -hmm. did Dan Sultan's uh, Old Fitzroy. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that something for Kate had a were a big influence yeah. on you. You covered um, You Only Hide. Um, Talk me through the, the process of recording that album. Why was that important to you, to, to, to reimagine those Australian songs and, and a vast a vast array? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I've always covered a lot of Australian songs at my shows. Um, I've covered many, many Australian songs. So I just felt like it would be a really fun idea to put together an album of Australian covers. Katie Lang did a Canadian version of that. She did an album of all Canadian covers. And um, uh, I love interpreting music in my own ways, uh, other people's songs in my own way. And there are so many songs that I've grown up with that have influenced me in certain ways. And I thought it would be a really beautiful project to try and, yeah, reinterpret those songs through the lens of my life. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, some some beautiful ones. Uh, let's just talk about, for example, like uh, back to the wall, the vinyls, mm. absolute, which which you just completely Missy Higginized mm. <laughs> in your own beautiful way as well. Um, yeah, what did the divinals mean to you, for example? Well, I I think I got onto the divinals fairly late in life, but when I did, um, yeah, Chrissy Amphlett was such a strong, again, mm. such a strong woman and an incredible front woman. Um, and she really just owned that stage. You know, like when they were performing, you, you didn't see anyone but her. <laughs> like she was amazing. Um, and to be able to, to to sing like that and to perform like that and she had a kind of a sexuality too that was like 
really, she owned it, you know, like she could be really beautiful and sexy and wear skimpy clothes, but it was totally her, you know, mm. she was in charge. Mm. Um, so, yeah, she, she was very inspiring for a young, you know, musician who was trying to kind of figure out who she was. And I love the fact that just, again, uh, I mentioned the Warumpi Band and, and Black Eyed Susan's artists mm -hmm. that probably a lot of your audience had no idea about or maybe had never heard before. Mm. And here you are presenting their works. I mean, the Black Eyed Susans was an interesting one because they were such mm. a Melbourne institution, if you like, who I yeah. always felt never really got their dues, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I wanted to include bands that uh, that I felt didn't hadn't gotten their dues and, and really famous ones as well. Like I, I liked the idea of... Um, yeah, of, of kind of showing people some artists that they may not have, not have heard of, but also the Paul Kellys and the, you know, mm. um, and the Divinals. But, uh, yeah, the Black Eyed Susans were, uh, I don't know, I got given their album like, yeah, 10 years ago or something and I was like, who are these guys? The lead singer is amazing. Um, and, yeah, when I met my husband, he was a massive Black Eyed Susans mm. fan. So they, that, that kind of came back and then we started listening to their albums over and over again and I, I love the idea of, of um, reinterpreting their songs with a bit of opera. We got Kate Miller-Heidke to sing a bit of opera on that song which was really fun. So, yeah. You mentioned Paul Kelly. Mm. You've had a long creative history, I guess, with him mm. for, over many, many years. Mm -hmm. I think one of my highlights was seeing you perform and I can't remember which event it was but it was... Uh, from Little Things, Big Things Grow, mm -hmm. was it um, Sound Relief or Wave Aid? Or? Yeah, or the, the Workers' Rights Rally okay, maybe. Yep, yeah, I, <laughs> I've actually performed that song a lot. I did, I did quite a few people want that song performed at rallies. <laughs> um, but, yeah, that was singing that with uh, I think it was Paul and John Butler. That's um, right, yeah. Yeah, that was really powerful. And maybe Dan Sultan. Yep. There's, there's yep. been a few different lineups. I can't remember which was which. But, um, yeah, that, that's such an incredible and iconic song. Mm. But, I've, yeah, I've covered a lot of Paul's songs over the years. It was actually really hard to choose which ones of his to, to put on the album. So it had, I had to put two on the album in the end because I'm just, I'm just such a fan. Well, there, there's a 50-year career there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And just, you know, from someone that really loves lyrics, his lyrics are just um, incredible. Like he's such a poet. Mm. Mm. And, and you're one of, the, again, the, one of the few women that have been embraced by artists like Paul Kelly of that calibre, you, you know, which, which you know, what, I mean, what do you think about that? I mean, I, I, I see that as, you know, uh, such a compliment to you and your music. Mm. Yeah, I mean, pa Paul's pretty supportive of a, a lot of music, actually. Mm. He's, he's mm. supportive of a lot of female artists. Um, but, yeah, I mean, it's always, it's always pretty a bit of a thrill when artists that you absolutely admire um, say that they, they dig your music as well. <laughs> Tell us about some of the causes you're involved with. So I've just become ambassador for the Stop Adani campaign and also the Asylum Seekers Resource Centre. Wow. Um, so they're kind of my two passions at the moment, climate change and the, um, you know, the refugee crisis. Uh, but, yeah, I've... I've I guess I've supported various things over the years just because it's great to do something with the, you know, the platform that you have. Mm. I feel like it would be a bit of a waste not to. Mm. Mm. Um, do you think it was fair that when you were, when, when, when all you were releasing your records that so many journalists concentrated on your sexuality and not the music and that you, it seemed to be written about a lot? Yeah, I, I don't. That was really annoying. Yeah. <laughs> actually, they kept trying to they kept trying to get it get out of me, like if I was gay or if, who I was dating, and I didn't want to talk about it because I I wanted it to all be about the music, um, and I also was trying to figure it out myself at the time too. So I didn't have a, a you know a solid answer to give them, and I it just felt too revealing. I didn't want to talk about my personal life with a stranger and mm. with, you know, thousands of people who would be reading it. So that was really frustrating at the beginning and I think that that was, is the other thing that made me kind of want to retreat because, you know, when, when you're that young, you're still 
figuring out who you are and you get thrown into the limelight and it's um, all of a sudden very, um, very kind of frightening and you feel like you've lost all of your skin. <laughs> all of a sudden you feel like you're on show and being judged and poked at. So I think that was a big reason why I ended up kind of retreating to Broome for a while to kind of just ground myself again and, and figure out what I wanted, you know. What was the most challenging experience of fame? What, 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 what did that feel like? What did that look like to you? Um, I think the most challenging thing was just probably being, being recognised or people thinking that they knew me. Um, I guess I've always been quite introverted. When I was really young, I was quite extroverted and then something happened in primary school and then from then on I've been much more comfortable just watching the world go by and I kind of retreated into my head. So once um, I started to get famous, it was, um, yeah, it was like it had been flipped and everybody was watching me. I was like, no, I want to watch you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think it just... It, it, it took quite a few years, I think, to recalibrate mm. and um, and and figure out like how to get perspective while all of that was happening. It's interesting that you've become a uh, a patron for the ASRC because mm. I really need to talk to you about O Canada, the song mm. you wrote uh, in tribute of the death of uh, Alain Curdy, and I, I get choked up. But I I remember playing this on Triple M and mm. introducing it. And being just as I am now, I was in floods of tears. Mm. It was one of the, I mean, it's still got an effect on me now. Oh, thank you. Well, yeah, you I mean, I, I had that reaction. That yeah, yeah. I, I had that reaction when I saw the, the photograph of that little boy. I mean, especially if you've got a little boy yourself, as I know you do. I just had, my boy was like six months old or something at the time and I just thought, you know, that boy could have been mine in another life. I would have made the same choice. I would have made the same decisions that that family made to escape that war-torn country and done anything I could to try and find a safe place for my family. Um, so I wanted to write a song that that humanised that family, you know, humanised their plight because, you know, thousands of people are going through the same thing on the seas at the moment every day and, um, and our country our government continues to treat them like criminals and, and lock them up indefinitely and it's so heartbreaking and makes me so angry um, and I think so many Australians feel so helpless. Mm. So when that photo, you know, did the rounds, uh, it was it made people feel all the more helpless, I think. Mm. Mm. Did and, you get a lot of reaction from that song? Yeah, there was, there was strong reactions to that song. Um, Good and bad? Uh, no bad, actually. Right. Yeah, I think, I mean, all that all the song did was tell the, their story. You know, mm. well, there was a few Canadians that said, "Don't blame us." You know, <laughs> so, I'm not blaming you. Have you listened to the song? <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I think ultimately they they just heard the story of this family, and there's there's nothing you can really say. Mm. It's like seeing that photograph. There's nothing. There's no more arguments once you see that photo. Mm. Mm. How has having a child changed your outlook on life? Oh, massively. <laughs> it changes everything. Um, I mean, he's just such a little bundle of joy. I just, I, I love spending time with him and I love that I can now be, you know, a working mum and, and spend time with him but also have my work and have my creative outlet and... It's a juggle, of course, and you're never satisfied with the amount of time you're spending in either, but I feel really blessed to, to have both those things in my life that I cherish so much. Um, yeah, he, he puts everything into perspective, really. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it's hard to get too um, wrapped up in my own ego, you know, because you've got this little <laughs> egomaniac that just wants your attention and does not care about what you're going through. So it's like, okay, yeah, I, I just have to forget everything I'm going through which is fine, which is great, and it's a relief, to be honest. Tell me about the importance of music in your life. The importance of music in my life. Um, it's always been a friend to me. Music has always been something that um, 
I don't know, it makes me feel like I belong, it makes me feel um, comforted. When I was a teenager, I just used to lock myself away, you know, for hours and hours playing a piano and guitar. And at school, every chance I got in recess and lunch break, I used to be playing music. I used to be playing an instrument and writing songs. And um, I think it was the only way that I knew how to express myself at that stage. It was my form of, of yeah, it was a catharsis. And, um, and I'm so grateful to that. I don't know what I would have done through those years if I didn't have music. And now it's, it's, uh, it's less of an urgent thing for me. It's a companion for sure and I couldn't live without it. Um, but I guess it's more, of, um, it's more of an old trustworthy friend <laughs> now, um, you know, rather than being in the honeymoon stage. <laughs> and, and I know that, you know, if, it, if it's gone too long without me playing music or without me writing songs, I start to feel a little bit... Um, like a balloon with its string cut off and just kind of floating and I need to be kind of brought back down and, yeah, remember who I am and, and um, I don't know, uh, consolidate. Like I need to write about what I'm going through at that point in my life and put it into song and then I can move on. <laughs> yeah. And uh, talk me through the Australian accent that you sing or the Australian affectation because it is a uniquely Australian sound you have. Mm. What do you think about how you sing? Um, well, I mean, it's changed over the years. My first album, I was super Australian. Um, I think because of what I was listening to at the time. I mean, I think I was, you know, inspired by the Waifs and something for Kate who kind of sung with a bit, a bit of an Australian accent. Um, and again, I was just really, um, you know, stuck on the idea of being authentic, you know. Mm. I was like, I don't want to sing in an American accent. I'm not American. Like, I want to be myself. Um, and the producer at the time, um, he was English, living in America, and he was like, can we just tone it down a little bit? It's a little bit harsh, that Australian accent, a little bit grating on the ears. And I was like, screw you, man. So I sung an, an even a stronger Australian accent because I was like, just to spite him. Um, which I think is why it sounds pretty incredibly ochre, that first album. Um, and I, I don't know, I've chilled out on it a bit over the years and I think maybe my influences these days are not so Australian because, I don't know, I guess it's so much easier to get international music on your, on your iPod. So I have a much broader range of influences, which I think has kind of toned it down a bit. But I, I like it. I like hearing people sing with an Australian accent because it's... Um, yeah, it's very, it's very unique. It's unique to our country and it and it's shows a certain sort of um, kind of pride in where you come from. You trailblazed the, uh, the early part of the decade, uh, you know, being so successful and I guess uh, doing what you do and, and, and no compromising in your artistry that you've influenced now a whole heap of up-and-coming female artists. What do you think Thank about you. that? <laughs> Oh, that's nice to hear. Um, oh, that just makes me so happy. Like the thought of influencing or inspiring anyone is exactly why you do it. I mean, well, that's not true. I write songs because I just have to. <laughs> it's pretty selfish <laughs> actually at the, <laughs> the essence of it. But um, it's a, that's like one of the best things about it. And I know that, you know, the people that influenced me as I was growing up just played such a huge part in shaping who I became and inspiring me to, to be able to be a front woman and to be able to carry it by myself and to, to not compromise. So mm. if I can inspire anyone to do that, that's great. What does it mean to you to be an, be an artist in Australia or be an Australian artist? Um, I think we've got a really amazing music industry here. I think Melbourne especially is just incredible for music. Um, I love this city. When I travel around the world, I just, the more that I travel, the more I love coming back here um, because there's always so much stuff going on. And um, yeah, I'm really inspired by the stuff that comes out of this country. What does it mean to be a, an Australian musician? Um, I, I guess it, it means kind of uh, honesty and um, 
kind of remembering who you are and I think we're travellers at the heart of us, you know, so it's like there's this kind of sense of, you know, we're Australian, we, we love our country and we're a part of the earth but we are explorers, you know, and we're not, we're not afraid to kind of go out there and, and gather inspiration and then, and then come back. One million albums sold mm. in your discography. What does that look like? What has that bought you when you condense literally. it down? Literally. <laughs> yeah, what is one million album sales? Um, Which is nuts. That's crazy. I'd like to say I bought a really big boat. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't um, blame you. <laughs> yeah, no, I guess it's been, um, it's been a trickle over the years, you know, because I'm... Um, I've had four studio albums and quite a few EPs. So it's been, yeah, it's, it's been a ride, but I've been lucky to have had all of my albums sell quite well over the years. Nothing has sold nearly as well as my first, but kind of consistently I think I've got, you know, a pretty solid fan base that, that um, stick with me. And playing live is one of my favourite things to do too. So I know that when I play shows, there's a lot of people that come out and see me regularly, which I feel very lucky about. What are your future plans, Missy? Because I know you've been dabbling in theatre and you had an acting role on Brand New Day mm-hmm. uh, and you say that, you know, it, it's, not, it, it's not imperative for you to release albums but writing songs obviously is still important to you. What, what do you think the next ten years hold for you? I don't know. I mean, I've, I've been... Um, acting and singing and dancing in a musical called Miracle City Um, and that's been so much fun, which I think is because it's just something so different for me. Like I like to change it up. I've written, you know, songs for for movies and for I've written the scores for theatre and just just trying different things I think is what keeps it interesting for me. I wouldn't want to just release album after album because... um, the music industry is changing and also I'm changing and I, I want to keep it fresh and interesting for myself, you know, give myself new challenges and new parameters to work within. So I would hope that the next year involves just a lot of interesting stuff that I've never done before that I can't possibly imagine right now. <laughs> <laughs> Missy Higgins, it's been great chatting to you today for the Australian Music Vault. No worries. Thank you. Thanks for having me.